Hi everyone, so today is going to be uh, the first of what will hopefully be a series on this channel of monthly entertainment wrap-ups where I'm going to be talking about all of the media that I've consumed that month, or at least some of the media I've consumed that month, but that I don't have enough to say about to do a full video on each thing individually. So I got this idea from a couple of booktube channels that I watch. This isn't a booktube channel, but I do watch a lot of booktube, so I, I got this idea as a kind of combination of the month of the weekly entertainment wrap-ups that Kathy Trithart does on her channel where she goes over all of the media that she consumed that week. They're great, you should check out her channel. And also from Mara at Books Like Woe who reads so much that she doesn't necessarily want to talk about every single book in her end of the month wrap-up so she will talk about just her disappointments, surprises, and hits. So I'm going to be taking that sort of structure that Mara uses and applying it to all of the media that I consume that month. And I will link both of their channels down below. You should check them out. I love both of their channels. They're both great if you are into books. Um, so let's just kind of go ahead and get into it. So I'm going to start with my disappointments. So my first disappointment I want to talk about is King of Wrath by Anna Wong. I've read from Anna Wong before and I've had very mixed experiences with her books. Um, I really love a lot of the tropes that she's dealing with, but her execution is kind of hit or miss for me. This was a miss, unfortunately. Um, it was a book that I think I should have liked in theory, but it just didn't take its ideas far enough for me. I wanted it to be a little bit darker or a little more wholesome or something. It just felt very mediocre. It felt like everything it was doing, it was doing halfway. Um, and I had one very particular issue with this that I really have not seen people talking about, and I think it's worth mentioning, is that the hero in this book reads as very much autistic. And as somebody who might be autistic, I don't have a diagnosis, but I think it's very possible that I might be, I related to a lot of those things. And I know that those things are associated with autism very strongly. Like, for example, he doesn't like his food touching. He takes everything super literally. I mean, not all the time, but it happens often enough he doesn't experience emotion in a neurotypical way. Like, there's just a lot pointing to the idea that this hero could be autistic, but that's never mentioned in the text. The word autism is never brought up, it's never treated with the kind of care and weight that I think that representation of a marginalized group should be, and it actually ends up making fun of those traits. Um, or at the very least, the heroine is making fun of those traits, and I have some pretty significant problems with that because that, that's never really challenged or addressed or treated as a problem in this book, and I just, I really did not appreciate that. And I hope that doesn't become a super major consistent issue with Anna Wong's books because I know that I've read Twisted Love, I've not read Twisted Lies yet, which may also end up having the same problem, I don't know, but Twisted Love also has a hero who reads as somewhat autistic, but it's a little bit less clear to me. This was like very, very obvious to me, um, to a point where I was like, this is literally an autistic character. You cannot convince me that this character is neurotypical, which I feel like is kind of an issue because it's not fully dealing with that reality of what it's like to live as an autistic person in the world and it's just treating those as like little personality quirks that can be changed or that should be changed or that it's okay to make fun of or tease him for or you know mess him up like threatening to give him a plate of food with the food touching which he doesn't like and treating that as if that's okay or messing up the way he has things organized in his house just because you're mad at him like I'm sorry I don't care how much of an asshole he is you don't get to do that like you don't know how much that might be affecting him especially given that he has all of these signs of being neurodivergent, like, that's just really messed up to me. And I really hope that um, if Anna Wong is going to continue to portray heroes like this, that she actually does address the fact that they could be autistic, because it's it's a problem. It's a problem in romance novels in general. This is one of the more egregious versions of that that I've seen. Um, and I, like I said, I have very up and down experiences with Anna Wong's books, and I'm going to be talking about another one later that I actually liked quite a lot better than this one. So it's not that I don't like Anna Wong or what she's doing, it's just this book really didn't work for me. And I think it might have suffered a little bit because I did read it very soon after I read the other book I'm going to be talking about, which I liked so much better. And when you read two books by the same author back to back, it can be so much easier to pick up on all of just the little idiosyncrasies they have, all the little phrases and lines that they use all the time. And 
some of that started to also grate on me a little bit, and I think that's probably partly my fault for reading this book so close to the other one. So I'm still really excited to read Twisted Lies. Um, that's the only one I haven't read that she has out yet, and also King of Pride. I haven't read that one yet either, and I'll, I'll get to those eventually, but I think I'm gonna try to put a little more space in between Anna Wong's books so they don't get too repetitive for me. Next, I'm gonna have two more disappointments. So the first of those I wanted to talk about is Batman White Knight with story and art by Sean Murphy and colors by Matt Hollingsworth. Uh, I really wanted to like this book a lot more than I did. I've liked other Elseworlds type Batman stories before. I just think that a lot of the draw of this is like, what if Batman but dark? Or what if, you know, we change the roles of the Joker and Batman as if that's never been done before? I don't know. I mean, and there might be elements of this that hadn't been done before this. That's fair. But I don't feel like it was that revolutionary to me. I don't know. And I also really did not love the implication that the Joker... Again, we're hitting the sanism, ableism type stuff again, where this portrays the Joker as if the only way that he can be a functioning, helpful member of society is if he cures his mental illness somehow. And that if he is mentally ill, if he is crazy or whatever, if he is really like, you know, the, the Joker, he can't be a productive member of society anymore. Um, and that those two things are mutually exclusive. And I have a pretty major problem with that because people who have mental illnesses or even intense mental illnesses, mental illnesses that involve some form of psychosis or other things like that can still be functioning members of society or at the very least are not necessarily evil because of it. And the way that this book handles the Joker's mental illness really does seem, it really does seem to me like what it's saying is that if the Joker is mentally ill in that way, that he is automatically evil and that those two things are connected and cannot be separated but that if he cures his mental illness then he'll be a good person all of a sudden he'll be a hero if he cures his mental illness and i just i really resent that i don't think that's a good look um i will say the art in this is pretty nice i i did like the art and as far as like the way it's dealing with bruce wayne it's nothing i haven't seen before Honestly, Batman but dark at this point is literally just what's happening in the mainline comics anyway. I want to see more stuff that's just, what if Batman but not dark? I feel like that's more subversive than, let's make Batman even darker. That's what we really need. Um, and there are some darker versions of Batman that I have liked. Um, if you're looking for something that's more of like a, a darker sort of Elseworlds version of Batman, I'd recommend Batman the Imposter, which I'll put the artist and, and uh, writer information in the comment in the in the description below if you're interested in that this just really didn't do it for me i'm going to be talking about harley quinn a little bit later too and uh harley quinn does kind of a similar thing with the joker but handles it so much better and i happen to end up uh encountering both of those things very close together so i think that might have also kind of hurt my uh opinion of this because I saw a much better version of what that kind of story could be in Harley Quinn. Ultimately, other than that, I mostly found this book very forgettable. I was going to do like a full review of this, but by the time I actually got around to the point where I would have done that, I just didn't care anymore. I just found it utterly forgettable after like a few days after having read it. Literally everything that happened in this book left my brain except the stuff that I had problems with. So it just didn't end up standing out to me enough to make a full video about it. Which is honestly kind of a disappointment in and of itself. So next, this other one is something where it's not a bad book, but it just didn't super work for me personally. This is still something that I would totally recommend if you're interested in it. It just wasn't for me. And this is Tell Me I'm Worth This by Alison Rumfit, and this is um, a very queer book, a very trans book, and I think that it is a very important piece of, of, of representation. It's also got a lot of really great things to say about fascism and about fighting fascism and how it pulls us apart from the people that we should be closer to, how it can make it feel harder to connect even with ourselves. Um, there's a lot of really great like thematic stuff going on in this book. It's just that the execution of it didn't work very well for me personally, but I do feel like it was a very effective execution of its ideas. It just was an execution that didn't work well for my brain and the way that I am as a person. Um, one of the things with this book that kind of made it difficult for me to engage with and connect with is the fact that I'm asexual in a way that just did not make this book a fun experience for me. There's a lot of sex-related stuff going on here 
that isn't really being romanticized or anything. So it's not like I was supposed to be like into it and I wasn't. It was more the opposite issue where you were supposed to be really kind of grossed out by some of the sex stuff going on in here. There was a lot of sexual stuff that was just like really intense and it just really made me feel super uncomfortable. And I, I get the sense that that's how you were supposed to feel in some of those scenes, but it was like on a level where it made it really difficult for me to want to pick up the book and to where it was just a really, really unpleasant experience. Um, and that's not the book's fault necessarily because I think that's honestly just a proof that this book was effective at what it was trying to do. But that's also just not a good reading experience. Um, it was to the point where I couldn't really enjoy it for what it was doing well um, because I was so distracted by that. And that was, you know, creating so much of a problem for me as I was reading it. It's very like stream of consciousness and I struggled a little bit with that. I had trouble wrapping my head around what was really being said sometimes. I found myself having to reread passages because my brain just wasn't like processing it. Um, and I always struggle with stream of consciousness type stuff. Um, for some reason my brain just really doesn't like it. Um, my brain just has a lot of trouble going from topic to topic like that, under following what's going on, following the sequence of events, and being able to keep track of both what has been said previously, how we got to where we are now with what we're saying now, and it, it's, it's just hard for me to follow that kind of writing, and that's very much what a lot of this is. But that being said, I would still Definitely recommend it if you like this kind of horror that's like very heavy on the social commentary and that's again just a very trans book, a very anti-fascist book, especially if you like more sort of literary horror. I would totally recommend this. It just wasn't a book that was for me specifically. So for my surprises, I have two things. The first surprise I wanted to talk about is Harley Quinn, the animated series, which I'm counting as a surprise because I didn't love the first season of the show. It was fine. I didn't hate it. But I also didn't particularly like it either. The humor was just this very like adult swim kind of like it's animation but adults and I, I just don't really love that vibe. But as the series goes on it does get a lot better and I was really surprised at how much I ended up really loving the third season of the show. Like I talked about before it does some really interesting things with the Joker that I think subverts a lot of the problems that I had with the White Knight. And of course getting the, that queer representation <laughs> in these things. I'm always here for queer superheroes especially in you know the Gotham neck of the woods, I guess you should say. I also found what they ended up doing with Bruce Wayne to be really interesting in the third season. I think they did a great job of both giving him an interesting arc and something interesting to do and ending his character in a really interesting place without him taking over the story, which would have been really easy to do. I, I loved Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy together. I feel like the humor got better um, and the humor also felt more like it was in the places it was supposed to be instead of like taking over scenes that should have been serious like I felt like it was in the first season especially. So I, I just had a much better time with this than I was expecting and the animation is also just really beautiful in, in this show. It's just a really nice show to look at. I was very pleasantly surprised at how much I ended up actually enjoying the show once I got to the end of it. And the other surprise I wanted to talk about is Some Like It Hot. Um, and this is something that I, I did mention this briefly in my video about uh, the body swap episode of Batman the Brave and the Bold um, because I ended up watching it since it was one of the inspirations for that uh, episode and I was very surprised at how much I enjoyed it. Um, it's really not my type of thing. I don't normally like comedy, especially of the more sexual variety. Um, so I was I was really surprised that I enjoyed it as much as I did, but it was a really fun time. It wasn't nearly as like problematic as I was afraid it was going to be, but at the same time, it really was kind of problematic, which is why it's not a hit. It maybe would have been a hit if it didn't have one particular scene that I found to be incredibly acephobic. It's like one of the most acephobic things I think I've ever seen. Um, if you took that scene out though, it's a great movie. And there's also a musical, which I, I think is worth mentioning as kind of an honorable mention here too, that I also really enjoyed. And it really updates a lot of uh, what's going on in Some Like It Hot, really makes the sort of trans and queer feels of that movie more explicit. Um, and it's it's a great musical and I'd recommend giving it a listen if you haven't already. Um, it's it's a ridiculous movie, but it is it is a fun movie. Like I think that is like the the fundamental reaction I had to is that I had fun watching it. And there are only so many things that I get to feel that way when I watch. I also found it fascinating how they managed to get around the Hays Code, because I'm pretty sure this movie was made during the Hays Code. 
So the fact that they managed to get some of the stuff through that they did is like kind of impressive to me. Um, I gotta say. So now I'm finally ready to talk about my hits for the month. And I actually didn't have this one on my list originally, but I did want to briefly talk about Cabaret, which I think it was this month that I listened to that and watched the movie for the first time. Um, I ended up really enjoying it so much more than I had expected. That probably could have also gone into the surprises category, but I did really love it. So I, I kind of had a little weekend where I was just really obsessed with Cabaret. I watched like a two hour video essay that David J. Bradley did on it, which I'll link down below assuming I remember to, and I listened to it like multiple times, multiple versions <laughs> over the course of this one weekend. I watched the movie. I was just having a time. I just, my brain decided Cabaret was the only thing we could focus on for a few days and it was great. I've, I've been finding that these kind of, these musicals that have an element of like a show within the show, um, I don't know how to describe it. Something like a Cabaret or something like a drag show within the show, things like that. Um, even like Sun Like It Hot, I think, falls into this category as a musical. Cabaret was quite good. There's a lot there about fascism and ignoring fascism and ignoring the rise of fascism because you can. I don't know that I can quite put my finger on like why my brain decided that was the thing that we needed to focus on for a whole entire weekend, but I am glad that it did because now I have another, another musical in my arsenal of musicals I can listen to that I quite like. And the final individual work that I want to talk about. I did want to talk about that other Anna Wong book that I read this month, and that is Twisted Hate. Um, and this book was just very much my tropes. Um, I do love a good enemies to lovers story. Like, it is absolutely my thing. Enemies to lovers is probably my favorite romance trope, but I want it to be real enemies. I want them to despise each other. Like, <laughs> don't give me any of this stuff where they're like, you know, they just kind of slightly dislike each other for like 50 pages and then they're over it. No, I want them to actually hate each other and this book delivered on that. It delivered on the banter, it delivered on the redemption of these two characters in each other's eyes. It was just so good and this is a little bit less dark than some of Anna Wong's books and the places where it is dark felt maybe slightly out of place to me um, and that's really the only complaint I would have about this. It is a long book, but it's got a lot in it. I think it's got enough in it that actually works for me. The miscommunication was made sense, and I bought why she didn't tell him what she didn't tell him, and why he reacted to that the way that he did. Miscommunication can be a difficult thing to handle, and I think in this particular book, Anna Wong does that so, so well. Definitely much better than it's handled in King of Wrath, which that's another issue I had with that book, but we're talking about this book right now. We're going to be positive. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that this book really has a very strong element of friendship, which I really love for a romance. I feel like romances often can end up implying that romantic relationships are superior to all other kinds of relationships and can end up kind of ignoring the other relationships that these characters might have in their lives. I mean, sometimes I'll talk about family stuff, but it's pretty rare that you get like a real strong element of friendship. And this book absolutely has that, um, both in terms of like their this whole series is framed around this group of friends, so we get some of that, but we also get specifically Josh and Alex sort of reconciling after what happened at the end of Twisted Love. So I would say that you should probably read Twisted Love before you read this if you want to really get the full impact of what is going on with their relationship, but I really loved the fact that they actually addressed that, that they actually get closer to that relationship and what Alex did to Josh as well as what he did to Ava in lying to them. I, I really love that we actually got to see that play out, that we actually got to see them come back together as friends and got to see how important that friendship is in both of their lives and how willing they are to do the work and show that it is work to maintain friendships and that it is work to reconcile as friends, you know, and that those relationships are really meaningful and important. And this book also, I think, does a pretty good job of just generally acknowledging that romance is not the end-all be-all of relationships in general. Um, I, I think there's a pretty strong possibility that one or both of these characters might be demi-romantic with just some of the things that they say. Especially Josh talks as if once romantic feelings start happening, he doesn't seem to be interested anymore. But the heroine in this, he's known for like years and eventually does form a romantic bond with her over the course of this book. And I just found that interesting. It's fair to say that this is demi-romantic representation. And it doesn't say that on the page. But I think the difference between that happening here and that happening in something like 
King of Wrath, where this character was reading as very autistic without it being said on the page, is that this was not judging Josh for being that way. The book was careful and thoughtful in the way that it was addressing that. Um, so I don't necessarily have a problem with not saying the word as long as you're treating it with the care that it deserves. And I think that was the case in this particular book. Josh literally says, I'm not in a relationship, and then he says in his uh, inner monologue, I, and I had zero interest in entering one anytime soon. Sex was just that, sex. Not a prelude to dating or matching couples' outfits or whatever people were into. I made sure every woman I slept with knew the deal because I didn't believe in leading people on or giving them false hope. My residency took up most of my time and even if I wasn't so busy, my desire for a long-term relationship hovered somewhere south of zero. I wasn't made for the commitment game. I always got bored after a few weeks and the whole couple thing sounded exhausting. Constant dates, phone calls, checking in with the other person. I shuddered at the thought. Good for the people who were happy and in love, but I wasn't one of them and I never would be. That's one of those situations where you don't necessarily have to say it on the page for it to be very clear that that's what's going on. And and Josh may not, you know, even know that's a thing. Like, that's not something that everybody knows about. I haven't really looked up to see if that was intentional on her part or not, but it is just an interesting thing to know. And that's pretty rare to see characters like that, where it's like so explicitly clear that that character is demi-romantic or Arrow or Ace in any capacity whatsoever. I also wanted to mention that it is also just like a very, you know, inclusive book in terms of understanding that like you don't have to be in a romantic relationship to be happy, which again, I really appreciate for romance. I, I do kind of relate to that feeling of like not necessarily wanting a relationship right away and feeling a little bit out of place in society because of that. From the heroine's perspective, it says in her inner monologue, I firmly believed people didn't need a significant other to be happy. If someone wanted to be in a relationship, great. If they didn't, also great. The same went for children, marriage, etc. There were no universal barometers for happiness. A person's life could be just as fulfilling without a romantic partner as it was with one. But there were times like now when I yearned to experience that kind of unconditional love, to have someone care for me through the good, the bad, and the inevitable mistakes I made. What would it be like to be loved so deeply by someone that I wouldn't have to worry about every little move possibly driving them away? And honestly, I very strongly relate to that, <laughs> to that idea of both what romance is, but also the reality that I don't need that to be happy and neither do other people necessarily. And, but if other people are happy, that's great for them, but not everybody has to have that to be happy. The happiness does not have to be defined by that. And I just, I love seeing that kind of thing in a romance. I think it's really important for that kind of thing to be in a romance, especially because of how often romance can end up privileging romantic relationships over, like, literally every other kind of relationship. Um, and the way that other media does that too. I definitely look forward to reading more Anna Wong and seeing which ones I actually love, like this one, and which ones I do not love so much. Um, because it seems like it's one or the other. Either I love it or I'm, like, really not into it. So it'll be interesting to find out how I feel about her books in the future. Um, and I think I've probably spent enough time on this. Honestly, probably could have done a full video on this book, but yeah, I just, I really love it and I would absolutely recommend it. And finally, the last one I wanted to talk about is not like an individual work, just sort of a category of media, and that is fan fiction. I will probably only really talk about this once, even though I'll probably continue to read fan fiction, but I really got into reading fan fiction for the first time this month and it's been a really awesome experience. I've pretty much exclusively been reading Batman fanfiction. My brain has decided Batman is a thing we're fixating on. I don't see that going away anytime soon. So I've been reading a lot of Batman fanfiction lately and I've been loving so much of it. It's just like it's so refreshing especially in comparison to what happens in the actual canon of Batman and you get to see so many different kinds of voices and so many different perspectives on this character and I really love that. Like I've I've cried more reading Batman fanfiction than the actual canon. I've been you know reading everything from smut to mafia AU to just general Bat Family stuff. It's been a great time. I would absolutely love to get into writing some fanfiction, and I probably will at some point. I, I, I don't plan on connecting that to this in any way, but it's just, it's a new world that I've discovered recently, and I've had a great time exploring it, and just exploring all the different ways that people interpret this character, um, especially as somebody who does see Bruce as somebody who could potentially be queer in a number of ways, who kind of headcanons him as potentially being trans mask or asexual or neurodivergent and seeing that other people feel the same way, other people see that in this character too, and, and getting to see that, those parts of myself represented in people's interpretations of this character that I relate to so strongly for those reasons, I've just really loved getting to explore that world for the first time and I'm really excited to explore more of it. 
So that is all that I wanted to talk about today. If you liked this video, like and subscribe, tell me down below what media you've consumed this month. Did you have anything that you loved, anything that you hated? Let me know all the things down below or what you thought of any of the things that I've talked about. And you can follow me on Instagram if you would like to. I'll have that link down below. And I will see you in my next video.